Okay, it's uh, six o'clock Monday, April 19th, and I'll call the uh, regular meeting of the Hyde Park Select Board to order. Um, welcome everybody that's here. Um, do we need any changes to the agenda? Not that I know of. Not, anybody else got anything to add or we need to? And uh, public comment. I see we have some folks, but I think they may be here for specific things. Yeah, I see somebody trying to log in. I don't know their name. And there's somebody on a phone line, but I don't know who that is either. Roger. I'm at Rogers. Hi, it's Roger. Okay. Let me fix it. Okay, can we uh, start with a review and approve oh. of the minutes of 3.15 and 4.5? So, yeah. I do see that uh, Dan Gotzigan just signed in. He wanted to say hello on the art project down by the oh. rail track. Yeah, okay. Uh, Dan, why don't... Dan's hey. muted. Hey, Dan. He is trying to get through, I can tell, because he got two two <laughs> Dan's now trying to get in. There he is. Hi, Dan. Hi, Ron. Can, I can't tell if my camera is working. It says it, it is. is. Yep, it's all good. Oh, there I am. Okay. So I uh, invited Dan to just say hi. He's the uh, artist that's been working with the uh, Vermont Arts Council grant and the steering committee, and we're going through some concept drawings and things and uh, trying to move forward with that project. That was a $5,000 grant from the Arts Council. So um, I don't think you know hardly anybody here, Dan, but why don't you introduce yourself and maybe we'll just have a conversation quick and then we have other business to jump on. Okay, and I'm only gonna have to, can only stick around briefly because I have another meeting I have to get to. But uh, my name is Dan Gottsagen. Um, I'm the artist chosen to do this uh, public art project. There eventually will be three sites, but the one I'm working on is at the rail trail parking trail, the trailhead where the parking area is just down from Main Street. So um, I've done several other public art projects in Vermont as well as others around the country. And for them, I, I'm actually, my studio work, I'm a painter and a printmaker, and I'm a former professor of art. Um, for the public art, I, the, my paintings are converted into a kind of architectural glass where the imagery is embedded in the glass. It's very luminous. And then those glass panels are set in steel, custom designed steel structures that can hold them. Um, I've done the two I've done in Vermont. One is in front of Healthy Living Market on Dorset Street in South Burlington. In case of any of you have seen that, that was done in about 2007. And then I did uh, a piece in front of the uh, State Public Sa Safety Building and State New State Forensics Lab at the Waterbury State Office Complex. And that was done right after tropical storm irene so i don't remember the date of that when irene hit it's around 2011 or something like that <clears throat> so um so that gives you a sense of what i've done a little bit and the concepts i propose are the uh i fi ultimately arrived at two concepts i think there's one that i think is the one we'll probably go forward with um because <laughs> kills two birds with one stone and it's a little more cost effective. The other one would cost more to, to do. And so um, it riffs off the idea of a train track and it's a curved linear kind of metal structure with these panels sit in there almost as railroad ties. And then the imagery I will develop with the community. Uh, I will work with uh, 
the kids at the elementary school, the teachers and the kids, and they will do some paintings that I will incorporate into this. Spend some time at the library, going through the historical archives, talking to other people. All of you are invited to be a part of the process as well. I would um, at some point want to reach out to you and hear your opinions about what makes Hyde Park pick, what makes it special, what you think should be celebrated in a piece of public art. From all that that I gather, I'll do paintings and then those paintings will be converted to the glass and then they'll be put into these metal structures. So I think that pretty much covers what, what I do. And um, you can always Google me. You can see the way my name is spelled there. If you just Google me, you can see um, the paintings galore on the website and on my website. There's also a menu that's public art and that will show you photographs of the other public art pieces. If, if you haven't seen them in person, you may have. So, and that's all I have to say right now. This time, Your Honor. It's um it it was a fun process going through and and uh, working with Dan and getting this far and one of the things that um, that he's really excited about and we are too is um, his his habit of getting the community involved but being very interested in getting the the uh, particularly the elementary school involved and the elementary school was on the was on the last call with us as we've decided that yeah this is a project let's 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 go forward with the next steps um, um i think it's a good as as we look at what we can do to create more community in hyde park this is exactly the kind of project that i think will be uh will be a big step forward we have a we have a lot of fun things beginning to happen in town so so the more of those community oriented things that we can to make Hyde Park a special place that we can do the the better it will be I believe. So anybody have any questions for Dan? Can, can I, I add I, one thing to yeah. that Susan, just about the concept because I kind of was describing the physical thing and you're mentioning the concept. So there's there's a couple of kind of concepts that underlie this and one is as Susan was saying is bringing the community together, the artwork or the process of developing the artwork, becoming kind of a nexus for intersection and communication and focused energy in the community. Um, there's a wonderful way it can work like that. But the other thing is for folks who are passing through on the rail trail to announce to them that they are in Hyde Park and the idea that we can actually invite people from the rail trail up to town would be pretty wonderful. There's, it's unclear right now that there's anything in town to draw people up to town. Um, there is the, the forking in gavel, right? There's not an ice cream shop or something like that. But maybe this will generate some economic activity. And so, um, again, something we can talk about, we can explore, how can the artwork actually act as a seed to kind of generate some other kinds of activity beyond even just the community coming together. So, th sorry, thanks for letting me say that, so. Sure. We're, um, anybody have any questions for Dan or, or uh, and I would definitely, I would encourage you to go look and see the, uh, see the, the, some of the work that he's done. It's really quite lovely. Okay. Well, thank you, Dan. And if you want to abandon us now, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to stick around because I'd like to know what you're, what's ticking. Um, can I stick around for five minutes or so? Oh, you can, you can Here stay I as long as, as you can stay as long as you want. <laughs> okay. We're always happy to have people. Um, and the other thing is you guys have to raise the money for this project. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've, uh, well, someplace when we have uh, the railhead, we might actually since since you're there, if we if you look on the agenda, you'll see the uh, the uh, it's the the art project update, and you've got a good a bulk of it from Dan. That the the group that got together looking at this, we've decided to move ahead with it. 
Um, we know we have to uh, we have to raise the money. Um, I've already talked with a couple of folks in town that are interested in helping us raise the money. We're going to have to raise, well, there's some grants that are available, but we're sort of going, well, it'd be nice to apply for the grants, but we want to get this project moving. So our goal is to raise um, $40,000 privately to pay for this first part of the project. So, um, and as I say, I've got a couple of people in town have already said they'd be they'd be happy and they've done fundraising before and they'd be happy to step up to the plate and help us. Uh, uh, $40,000. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, to see, to, to see about see about doing that. Um, I think other than that, I think that that uh, that pretty much there is there is conversation in the legislature right now about the uh, the agency of natural resources uh, taking over the maintenance of the Lamoille Valley Trail. And there is currently money in the capital bill to complete construction of the rail trail. Um, but but we'll we'll see what it looks like at, at the end of the year and what happens. But I think it'd be um, uh, it'd be terrific if the state takes over the uh, you know the regular upkeep and maintenance of the of the rail trail. Um, okay. That takes care of 11. <laughs> but anybody have, have any questions? Okay. Um, our quickie number two is just to review and approve the minutes of 315 and 405. We, we move those up to the top because I always have them at the bottom and we end up not doing it. So I thought, oh, let's do something easy at the beginning. Uh, I move we accept them as written. Yeah. Got, got, a, got a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of uh, approving the minutes of the meetings from 315 and 405, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay. Um, next, the fire department bylaws. Ron, what's the what's up? And I bet Rogers has has Roger. Have you seen those yet? No. No. I For uh, Roger Audet's really not involved with the bylaws. Uh, Chief Carrier and I have been working at them with the membership as well as the town attorney and the select board. So we are. Uh, at a point where there was a last minute change before last Thursday's fire membership meeting and the fire officers wanted more time with it. So I, we won't be able to act on it tonight, but we'll keep it on the agenda till we're done with that. I don't know if you have anything else, uh, Chief Carrier, if you're still on. I see him, but I don't hear him. So he might be on text or something. Nope. See you, Brad, but I can't hear you. We're going to get Roly to give him lessons. So I think, Ron, was That's there an issue around whether, because in the, um, like they elect their officers and our lawyers change to appointed, because isn't that technically what we have to do to be in yeah, compliance I mean, with state law? Yeah, it's what it's, it's the same process you followed before where the fire membership votes their officers uh, for two year terms. They vote half, basically half the officers one year and half the other. So it's you know, half and half cycle on a two year term. And then 
the list of appointees, appointees or recommendations, however you want to look at it, goes to the select board. And the select board in the current bylaw draft says we'll appoint those folks to those positions that were voted by the membership. So the issue of uh, concern was, OK, so if you're going to vote to accept the recommendations what happens if the vote doesn't happen what what happens if there's an objection what happens if you want to pull one up fire officer out and say we don't think that person should be promoted to lieutenant or whatever so my reading of that was that the process we followed is what's in the bylaw which is the membership votes and the select board follows that and appoints those people that's what happened with the fire chief thing earlier this year where I think it was Roland that said, we've always done it this way. Let's just keep it going. What, what do we, you know, let's follow what they say, the membership. And I, and I think that's what she put in the bylaws. The technicality is that the select board being the legislative body in control of all hiring and firing in the end actually has to make that decision to appoint those people. It, the fire department doesn't appoint themselves. It's always, you know, all town employees, committees unless you're elected are through the select board and that's that's how it's going to be so i think when i talked to brad earlier about it i think he said he just wants a little more time to work that out with his membership and i said i think there's a special meeting coming up on may 3rd so we can push it if you need to and it and i i think that's the plan right now so I'll continue to work with Brad to make sure their concerns are addressed or the, the wording is tweaked or whatever needs to happen. Okay. And um, that makes me think Roger had asked the question of if, if uh, fire department members don't live in Hyde Park, can they vote? And the answer is yes. Correct. Yes. We, we, we asked our lawyer and, and uh, the answer is yes, they can. um roly do you have any questions or look anything that came to mind with the with the bylaws the only thing i had is if, like we run into that when i was first on a haze in there we had in the fire department whatever and how does that come out that the members have to vote. The members are the only ones can vote to kick them off or fire them out of the fire department. How, how does that work? Uh, I didn't understand that part. Uh, the, way, the way it's worded, the fire chief is the one is responsible for dismissal and the, all the officers have the right to an appeal to the select board. To the select board? Yeah. Okay. If, if they, well, if, I just, if they disagree with the chief's decision if they disagree with the decision but the select board still is in charge here yeah that's how that's how it works okay 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 so i guess we will um we'll give the we'll give the fire guys some uh folks whoop don't want to make um and we'll do a we'll do a vote on this and finally get it off the table <laughs> uh, the uh on the third of may um next is okay i do have that off Ooh, keep scrolling up and down here is the uh the local emergency management plan and um and ron you can fill us in and roly there are a whole bunch of places where the name says susan bartlett and susan bartlett is really receptive to replacing that name with roland because it because that's who we were talking i know you've got experience in in sort of the management and this sort of stuff and and hopefully if you want to start to get a little involved that would be great but at x places a name has to go in so i guess the chair dave didn't tell me the exciting part about being chair is whenever ron needs a name put in the chair's name gets put in so so ron if you want to bring us up to speed that'd be that, great that's why you make the big money 
Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is an annual update, which does require that kind of conversation about who's going to step back first or who's going to step forward first. Uh, it, it is, it, you know, with the EMD in particular, which is vacant, state law says it defaults to the chair, but the select board could appoint Roland. That would be a motion that you would have to make. And then we can update the LEMP. The LEMP itself is a reporting tool to the state of Vermont, letting them know that we at least have some warm bodies in all these emergency management uh, roles. Uh, but then they also need a point of contact, which typically is the EMD. Uh, the emergency management director, for example, was the point of contact for the fire department shots and trying to get that early to the firefighters from the state of Vermont's uh, stockpile. So without a motion, we're, we're not meeting again before May 1st. So if you wanted to make that change with Roland, uh, it would be basically uh, filling the EMD role. Um, and then if somebody from the community wanted to step forward eventually and take over, Roland could decide to, to step aside or keep it if he likes it. Uh, but it is a communication thing with some regional meetings thrown in. I think there is one person that I have talked to who I tried to reach out to. Um, I called her once or twice. and. I didn't get no response to them. And um, I have one person that is interested in, in giving me a hand or stepping up in another year once he got some more stuff underneath his belt. So that would be a possibility to work together with him. that's a decision you can make um, the lemp itself is uh it's like a five-page document that lists where your shelters are what kind of equipment we have in town that could be shared who the ambulance service is all those kind of things so the question of do you want to approve the draft as is which is which has susan in it which has our new eoc or emergency or emergency um, EMC, Emergency Management Coordinator, which is Don Archbolt. Um, is that Don saying hi? Um, and have that go forward with uh, to the state, or do you want to change that with Roland? I think that's the only change we're talking about uh, that's not in the current LEMP. Sure. What you want to do, Roland? Uh, I'll, you know, I'll step up and do what I can do, and we'll see where it can go. Okay. Then, uh, then I need a a a um, motion to appoint Roland as the uh, most we're, we're the EMD, right? We got too many letters floating around here. Yeah, you could you could have a motion to appoint Roland uh, as EMD and approve the LEMP with that change. Okay. <laughs> do it all at once. That's right, do it all at once. Okay, somebody so, give me so a motion. So okay, moved. got a second? Second. Is that? Okay, we've got the second. Um, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed, anybody abstaining? Good. Okay. I gotta get. I should have printed out a copy of that. Um, five. <laughs> Lawn alternatives. That's a great topic, Ron. <laughs> so open to a lot of interpretation there. So what? Do, what do we mean by lawn alternatives? Ron, now you're muted. <laughs> um, we have a presentation from the Hyde Park Energy uh, Committee that uh, wants to take over the screen. So I'm going to try to share with uh, Megan or Meg Taylor. And if she can do that, I think that's all you need, right? Is the screen. 
Oh. Now, now it goes. <laughs> okay. So hold one second. I'll try to do that. You may have to look on your screen to figure out what buttons to push. Okay. Okay. All right. I think you should have control now. Takes too long. We'll do it without, but. Okay. No. I'm going to have to restart and rejoin. So I might do that. Elisa, what, or is Elisa on? If not, Denise, if you maybe want to give a quick intro. Sure, I can give a quick intro. We go ahead and sign off and come back in. So good evening, everyone. I'm Denise Green of the High Park Energy Committee. I'm the co-chair and I live up on Fitch Hill. And we have been um, delving into this program called Lawn Alternatives. Um, and it's something we would like to offer to as part of the Energy Committee. Um, and we would like to offer it to homeowners and to um, businesses and schools. And it has three initiatives with it that we would like to um, present to the town. Um, one of them is, um, is called Raise the Blade. And Raise the Blade is a program, oh, here comes Meg. Raise the Blade is a program from the um, Lake Champlain uh, watershed and they have been doing it over there for some time and it's a campaign um pretty simple premise raising the blade three inches um will help uh decrease runoff it will um help decrease um uh it, drought tolerance it'll help increase drought crop tolerance in lawns and um and really protect your your watershed from runoff. And um, it's a pretty simple thing uh, that people can do. And we would like to promote it with, um, with the campaign that's going on. And we have a representative here from the, um, the campaign is Linda Patterson. And also, um, this Danielle Osarski, she's from the uh, local watershed, the Lamoille, is it the Lamoille watershed? Yeah, and um, she's gonna um, be working with us, helping us out with this, um, and has been a great help so far, as well as Linda has. So um, the next part of this uh, lawn alternatives is, um, is our lawns to meadows. So um, I've been a master gardener since 2013, and um, I've done a couple of, well, one of my main focus as a master gardener is, um, is educating people on converting their lawn to a meadow or a, even pollinator strips to attract pollinators to their property and, um, and other beneficial insects and wildlife. And so I would like to take this one step further um, by adding this element to our campaign and uh, doing an educational program here in Hyde Park um, as a master gardener and working with the village. There's a property that can be utilized to um, put in a pollinator meadow, but let's not go any further because we have someone who's installed a meadow here, Ron Rajensky put a nice meadow in the back of the parking lot at the town offices. 
So um, great job, Ron. It looks beautiful. And um, and so that program is going to be happening in May, May 22nd. I believe that the um, the library friends are going to be helping me with that. They're going to be sponsoring that too. And also, um, I will probably be doing another program on um, invasive species. So those two are kind of tied together with this, um, with the pollinator uh, meadow. My focus is on using uh, local species of plants. So um, the invasives is pretty important. Uh, to tie that into. And then the other thing we'll be doing is um, is the Mo Electric program, which is being uh, launched in Charlotte right now. And the Stowe Energy Committee is very interested in doing that with us. So um, Mo Electric is a program that, um, well, let me look it up here because I haven't. Okay, it's a consumer awareness campaign to help residents, villages, and towns begin switching to electric mowing and yard chore equipment. So um, there are rebates provided by electric utilities, uh, manufacturers, and dealers. I know we have three utilities here in Hyde Park, so um, we hope to work with, with them and, um, and see what they will do. And the Mo Electric campaign, chairperson uh, is gonna be doing that too. Um, so the town of Charlotte began their campaign this month. We'll have a draft proposal um, that um, actually we'll have a proposal for that. And um, we'll be doing a lot of promotion of that on Front Porch Forum, as well as um, promoting the other lawn alternatives. Um, hopefully we'll be doing some, um, we're looking into doing some uh, interviews and letters to the editor newspaper and there's also some really nice program um uh signs and collateral that goes with the mo with the raise the blade campaign that we are um excited to be able to share too so if anyone wants to add anything to that <laughs> i i was just gonna say denise with um if you have like little one page handout sorts of things up in North Hyde Park. And we do it down in the in, in the uh, village as well. But we have a table and we give out, you know, bags and that sort of stuff to support Green Up Day. And I would mm -hmm. think being able to give out some information on Green Up Day about this sort of thing would be great if you have some. Yeah, I think that um, we can get some. I, I know that um, for the uh, raise the blade. I imagine there's something that Linda can provide us. It's uh, there's also some nice um, online um, information and videos that people can access for that part of it. Um, I have a poster coming out for the lawns to meadows and a flyer and Mo Electric. I think not sure. Elisa, what what do we what do we have for Mo Electric? We have a handout for that too, probably. Susan, who would we give it to in um, for Northside Park? Uh, Liz Courtney. Okay. And if you just, um, I'll be down at the uh, either in front of Fork and get. <laughs> assuming it's decent weather, I'm not doing it in the snow. <laughs> but assuming decent weather, I'll probably be out in front of Fork and Gavel or by the library. And um, you could just leave stuff at the uh, in the entryway at the uh, at the town office, and I can pick it up there. And actually, if you want to leave some at the town office for me, I'm actually going up to the Guyon Halls one day this week, um, towards the end of the week, I think to get a tour so i could bring stuff up if you think you'd have something ready by then i can do that for you as well okay so well, i'm i'm linda patterson with lake champlain sea grant and also with the race of blade and i'd love to flesh out just a little bit more about the race of blade campaign if we had time but i'm also wondering meg if you were able to pull up the slides that you had created because those have some really good visuals 
No, unfortunately, <laughs> technical difficulties. It was asking me to reboot again, so I'm not really sure why. But I'd be happy to share the presentation um, with this group after the fact. And um, I think it would be good to elaborate a bit. So if you don't mind taking the lead on that, Linda, or um, I can jump in. But. So really quickly, Raise the Blade is part of the Lawn to Lake um, Consortium. And we have lots of partners, including Lake Champlain Committee. Lori Fisher is one of our members. Lake Champlain Basin Program, the Vermont Composting Association, a representative from the Department of Environmental Conservation, um, and also, um, well, that, that's about it. So we've been together for many years, and Raise the Blade is just our most recent campaign, and its basic principles are we're promoting having people raise the blade on their lawnmower to three inches, and also to leave the clippings on the lawn instead of um, bagging them. And then there's another one of um, not mowing too much of the height of the grass blade at one mowing just because that can stress the, the grass. But our whole, our whole point is to help, as um, Denise said, to reduce stormwater runoff. And that can happen because the longer the grass blade, the longer the root, and so there's more porous area for the um, stormwater to be absorbed. And then if you leave the clippings, you are adding a natural fertilizer, which adds organic matter to the soil. And that makes the soil a lot more absorbable, um, be able to absorb a lot more stormwater and also filter it. So we have a really exciting campaign. We've got um, over 12 businesses in the Chittenden County and North area who have joined the campaign as well as South Burlington um, joined it. And we're talking to Shelburne, they are interested. Um, and possibly Heinsberg. So um, the great thing about businesses and municipalities supporting us is that you all have great visibility in terms of, um, you know, you're setting, a, a, you're setting an example for the community. And so as Denise mentioned, we have lawn signs that, um, that cities and, and businesses are putting up that have the logo of the campaign. We also have what we call rack cards. They're these informational cards, like what you get in your doctor's office for distribution. We do have in information sheets and we always give a shout out to the town or the city or the business who has joined the campaign in support of the practices um, on our multiple social media sites. And we have lots of other ways to get out to individual homeowners. We are going to have an electric lawnmower raffle um, which will be our second one. And we, prior to COVID, do a lot of tabling. And we also do a lot of publicity in various newspapers. So if, um, if we might move forward as a campaign, then with the town, um, we would really have lots to share um, in terms of bringing biz local businesses and other um, town offices on board. Um, so that's the that's the nuts and bolts of the campaign and one of us can share the lawn to lake website with you and it has a whole lot more detail on it thank you linda um for filling in the gaps absent the presentation um yeah so i think our main goal for tonight um is to get the select board on board with um this idea of this kind of three pronged approach, which we would like to roll out in the community um, and to local businesses. We definitely have, um, especially through Raise the Blade, some great um, tools to get the word out. Um, and we did also speak with the village trustees last week and they were very supportive. Um, so I guess I would open it up perhaps to questions from all of you before, before you feel comfortable moving forward with any kind of support. I guess I got one question. This is Roland. You said that um, leaving your grass longer, raising your blade is better for the runoff. Okay. Now, what about the state? Because I worked for a town for a long time, and this was a big fight where the state is going into doing all this ditching, putting all this stone in ditches and everything like this. We tried to get them to leave the grass in the ditches. The stone is going to fill up with sand 
Mm. And you're going to be right back to square one. And you would be with the grass. But I still think the grass is better. If you guys reached out to the state to try to figure this out, the money it's going to cost the taxpayers, the town people to meet their specs. And, and you're saying leave the grass longer and the water will run off slower. And I agree with that 100%. But if, if we can't, you know, do our ditches, I mean, it's crazy with all this rock we're putting out in the, into the state here. It's cost so, a lot of money. Um, that is not uh, an area that we're focusing on, but I hear your point and I can certainly take it back to our committee, which we meet next week. Um, we do have representative, as I said, from the DEC, uh, and then one of us will be glad to get back to you about that. Um, our main focus is on, as I said, um, businesses, municipalities, and individual homeowners, but your point is, is taken and I'll pass it on. Believe me, I passed it on too. <laughs> okay. Well, and, it, and of course, as, as Roland saying, the amount of ditching that communities are, uh, you know, that, that we have to do. Um, and it's all about stormwater and cleanup and all, you know, and all this sort of stuff. But he's right over time, um, all that rock is just going to get covered with runoff. And uh, then it's either not going to be effective or the towns are going to be expected to clean it up, which <laughs> will be a very interesting project. How you clean up a bunch of dirty rocks without getting more runoff is, I'm not sure anybody quite went that far in their thought. So it, it's in terms of, uh, in terms of quantity and impact, you're right. That probably is a great fight for you guys to, for you guys to take on. And I think you'd probably find a lot of, a lot of town road crews um, would uh, would agree with Roland, saying, you know, that it's it's a uh, it's at least as effective, and certainly cost wise, it's probably more cost effective than what we're doing with, you know, with with uh, with all this rock. Mm -hmm. Do you anyway. um, do you know where the airport you know where the airport Marshall is? Uh, do I know? Okay, I've been watching that. Last summer, yeah. they did all that ditching down through there and put all that stone in there. And right by Sonny Miller's farm, you look at that ditch, it comes out of that road, goes to the culvert. That mm -hmm. ditch is already filling up with sand. And you ain't gonna be able to see the, if we get a heavy rain before the end of the summer, you won't see that rock in that ditch at all. Yeah. But if you had the grass, it would be great. Yeah, I think you're. I think you you're close on the whole concept. Uh, Jim Ryan, who's the ANR specialist on what Roland's talking about, is the new MRGP road standards, where all the towns in Vermont have to go and put in stone line ditches where there's a five percent slope. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of stone going in. I asked Jim Ryan a couple of years ago. I said, "Are you?" totally going to expect towns to go back and dig these stones out and fluff them up and get all that sand winter sand out that obviously we still are going to apply for forever and he said that's not the primary goal to keep those clean he, he's he said that yes they will fill in they will create vegetation obviously it doesn't take much vegetation to grow um, grass or whatever on top of rock you just need a little bit of sand and debris and his his statement was something along the line of that will be a stable ditch it's got so much rock in it it will never wash out the water will run on top where you need to have the grass you need to have some filter on the grass now at some point those ditch lines will be full like i think what roland's indicating at some point and he he was not willing to answer that question about the cost of actually filling in those filled ditches so there's a, a multi-step part of this. It's the new ditch, it's the filled in ditch that starts to grow vegetation, and then it's the full ditch where the storm water is overtopping the ditch and going and creating new erosion. At some point, the towns and state are gonna have to get in there and stop that overtopping. How long that takes, nobody knows. And, and the cost of it. 
Yes. Well, I, yes. Who's going to do it? Who's going to cost? It? Yeah. Well, we already know the answer to that one, right, Roly? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> well, let's guess who's going to have to pay for that. Okay. <laughs> but I, but I agree with, I agree the, the grass is great. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, so, it's a, so it's worked for hundreds of years. The reason we're here is to talk about the amount of grass lawns in Hyde Park and by doing these three things, obviously mow electric isn't going to help much, but but raising the blade and those impermeable surfaces, which we call grass lawns, um, will be more permeable and there will be less runoff. And so we're hoping this campaign is, is going to be um, well received in the community. So, and we're ready to go with it. So we just want to get your blessing on, on approving the program that we're proposing tonight. And uh, is there, is there Meg, any other questions we'd like to address? Yes, I, 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 Meg, you said you, you live on the, Fitch Hill, Denise, right? Yes. Okay. You go out and you look at the bottom of Fitch Hill and look at the gravel that's running in that ditch right now. Have you paid attention to that? Huh? I certainly have. Okay, I, I usually always mow that. And I always keep that looking good. Mm -hmm. This summer it's going to not going to get looking so good, but that right there, the grass is stopping that right there. What do you think if that ditch is full of stone? Yeah, we have um, we we have a dirt road now because of the project that's going on in town. So a lot of that runoff is coming off from the dirt road. Yeah, um, I know. And I'm watching that dirt road go down into the storm drain, which is a shame. Um, but it's a temporary thing. It's the project will be um, done this year. I wish they had put some sort of um, uh, I don't know some something to stop that water from going um, down there, but. I'm not sure how to do that and, and whether they um had that i know i live right i live right in that house right there the ranch oh do you okay yeah yeah i didn't know that well <laughs> it's, my, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's my dooryard but the only thing we could do is what they did and, and it's worked good i watched it all winter mm -hmm. the blacktop that they ground up and left there has worked great but right now it just needs some attention you know yeah but, I'm just yeah. trying to make a point that if that was all stone, that ditch all the way down through there, you know, the grass Meg, is holding it. Meg, did you get to the point where you asked what we want the select board to do? Do you have that um, that slide? Can you ask them? Yes. Yeah. So I think there are a few things. One is to support and improve our efforts in awareness about uh, among our residents regarding the benefits of the, that kind of three-pronged approach. So it was lawn to close, raise the blade, and mow electric. Um, two was to allow us as a committee to negotiate with current contractors to kind of request that they cut the grass to three inches. Um, and three is to work with the town highway department to plan for a transition to electric-powered um, tools and vehicles, uh, lawn mowing. Um, we currently um, around the town hall we we cut with um, the contract is with the Department of Corrections and so if it's okay with the select board I'd like to ask them to raise the blade at the town hall if that's okay with you. You know I've got that that would be me Department of Corrections and I'd like to do a little educational aspect for you so you understand uh, how commercial uh, mowers work and how they uh, uh, how they do it. Usually in the spring of the year, <clears throat> all the uh, mowers lower their blades down to a two inch level. And the reason for that is because of the um, how fast the grass grows in the spring of the year. All the nutrients and stuff from the winter time have, have uh, promoted the growth and the fresh um, the rain we usually get in the spring. The grass pops up real quick. And so what you do is you lower your blade down so that you can uh, stay ahead of the grass and then as the warmer weather is uh comes you you raise your blades back up and uh and into it now it's advantageous for us to have uh um the blades up to three inches but um that you've seen the stripes they leave in the lawn make it look nice and pretty and stuff 
that comes from when the blades of the grass are up high enough so that you can leave those uh, lines in the lawn. Okay, so uh, uh, at springtime, they go down. Uh, once it warms up, they come back up and they stay up for the remainder of the season. Um, so the grass is growing so fast in the spring of the year, uh, it's coming right back up. So it isn't going to impede, I mean, it's not going to affect the, uh, the uh, flow of water because the grass is growing so fast. And plus it's absorbing uh, water, moisture from the soil at a higher rate because of the, uh, um, because of the um, um, rate, uh, uh, it, it's absorbing it because the ideal growing season is in the spring of the year. And that's that's why that's doing it. You you really don't see in the spring of the year that they've lowered their blades down because it does grow up so fast in there. But I I am uh, I have done some of the research on some of the electric uh, mowers. They're saying that on a full charge, <clears throat> and I know there's a lot of variables to it with electric versus gas. Um, but the uh, electric ones, um, they say you can hold the charge up to seven hours. So when you say up to um, I, I hope the uh, research goes into it and goes for, you know, at least 14 hours so that uh, um, a crew that gets out there doesn't have to be searching for some place to charge it. And I don't know if it takes a special charger. I haven't looked into it that much to see it. But um, I would entertain, uh, um, because of the situation that uh, the Corrections has, that they research that and, uh, and look into uh, electric motors to see if uh, it would be better. From what I've read, they're supposed to be able to compete with the uh, with the gas ones all except for the the length of time the um like i said seven hours that would be only a uh, downfall to it and then uh, uh in vermont uh, i'm not sure where the testing was but we have hills and uh and that stuff takes uh draws from your electric anybody that's got a electric car would be able to tell you that uh, it's a little bit different depending on the environment you're, you're working in plus if you're um working in commercial you have to get out there first thing in the, in the morning to, to start doing your work. When the grass is wet, it, it takes a lot more out of the mower than it does when it's dry. Those are just some uh, points that I thought would be interesting. A, uh, a key piece Thank of you, information Brian. you may not all have about Brian is that he works in corrections. Yes. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> yes, we, okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, Linda, what do you have to say about the, uh, what Brian said about two inches? I was afraid you were going to ask me that. <laughs> um, you know, we we recommend the three. Uh, I hear what you're saying that it grows up so fast in the spring um, that uh, that is basically getting to three really fast. Is that basically what you're saying? Yeah. So I think that our campaign is really interested in um, support and involvement. And so we are really willing to work with towns around one, you know, what they can do, whether it's, you know, they can't, they can't mow at three on a ball field, but they can mow at three in a certain other public area, or they have practices that, you know, mow at a certain point during the early part of the year, you've always done it that way and you find that it works fine because you're ultimately committed to the three inch height um, for the reasons that we are, then that's something that that the, the campaign would work with. Um, probably what we would do is if you're willing to post one of the signs, we would post it once you start mowing at three. Does that make sense? Um, uh, explain it, that a little bit more uh, about posting the sign. Well, so um, you you will receive a picture of it from Meg once you can get the slideshow. But it's a it's a sign that just it's the same size as the campaign sign, and it just has um, raise the blade and the reason why you know to help with reducing stormwater runoff, leave the clippings, and then on the corner of the sign would be Hyde Park's logo. So we, we personalize the sign depending on whether it's a business or, or a city or a, or a town. Um, and we ask the business or the town to place them in um, high visibility areas because the towns and the businesses are just fantastic publicity for the campaign. They're a great way to educate um, the public um, because the public's out and about driving around and they'll notice the sign. Uh, and then there's, you know, they can 
on the website or depending on where the time is, we will have those track cards, you know, available at counters or checkout places, um, wherever, you know, wherever is convenient so that people can actually take a card um, home with them. So that's really what we do is we go to towns and we come to their select board or to their city council and we say, this is what we're promoting. Will the city or the town adopt it? And, and they say, yes, in these circumstances, we can, and we'll, we're glad to put up signs in these circumstances, we can't follow them at all, or we can follow them part. Does that make sense? Yes, and okay. also, I, this would be an advantageous uh, time for you to, uh, if you were to speak with the Department of Corrections, because every county in, in the state has uh, workers, and the majority of their work is during the summer months is uh, um, mowing lawns. And we do all the fish and wildlife sites and in, in, in the state and uh, maintain those, plus uh, hundreds of municipalities uh, throughout. But um, this is the time when they're going to start buying and purchasing uh, uh, new equipment, especially with the crews. I, I got notified today that the crews will be starting back up um, around June 1st. And so mm -hmm. There'll be a great big demand coming out, but I know those mowers that we've had have been sitting around for now almost two years um, without being run because of the COVID and, and uh, the winter before that. And uh, and so um, there's going to be purchase orders going out for new mowers. And if, they, if the state was aware of maybe, I don't know if the state is eligible for the uh, rebates and stuff too, that might be something that they'd be interested in, and uh, you, you folks would be a great voice for that. And I'd be willing to give uh, one or two of those more to try. That's great, Brian. Um, I'll, I'll touch base with you about that. Okay. Okay. I get. I got one question. Now, now, this program you're promoting is just for education, correct? It, it, the, the, there's no way that you're headed towards the avenue of telling the taxpayers of Hyde Park they can't mow the lawn below three inches. No. Uh, are, are you asking me? No, it's it's really, it's public education. And yeah. and it's, it's basically trying to get people to um, understand the value of longer grass. It stays greener longer, it, you know, it, it's much healthier. There's just a whole lot of reasons why we, we are promoting it. Um, and hopefully people sort of, it's like a cultural shift, right? People have a sense in their minds that they've always liked really short grass. It looks, you know, neat and clean and crisp and crew cut. So we're, we are actually trying to encourage people to begin to change their idea of what looks good. Because if they know that it's good for their you know, water quality and stormwater runoff reduction, they're going to begin to think, Oh, longer grass looks better, or at least that's our hope. So, um, well, no, no, Dave, we're not going to make them do it. No, it's all suggestion. I do have a question for you, Brian. Do you know who is, um, are you, or is the town mowing the property over at the Cricket Hill Trails, or is that the Cricket Hill Association that mows that? area i believe it's cricket hill oh it is okay yeah figured it was so would the select board um entertain a motion to uh, uh approve of our promoting this and um what was the other part uh meg what was the other part of do you have that So what was the part that you said? Approve our, sorry, you broke up. Um, approve, approve our promotion of these three programs. But then there was a second part. We had used the word negotiate. I think maybe it's just like allow us to like enter into, com or like be comfortable with us entering into conversations with um, like current contractors within the town, as well as, um, yeah, I guess all, all long care contractors contractors within the town to kind of discuss this initiative and and try to get them on board. Yeah. We just want to make sure that's okay with the select board. Sure, I got Roly, Dave, are you there? 
Yeah. Yep. How's this sound, everybody? I I think it's a, a you know you can ask people, of course. Um, I don't know if you need our approval for that, but if it's a, a private contractor, you can approach them. But I think your biggest your biggest uh, object, I mean your biggest hurdle is going to be uh, uh, selling them on an electric uh, mower that's going to be dependable, and and it may already be. It just needs to be tried and true uh, with the contractors out there. Once they once they discover it, they don't have to go to the gas pump every day. They can just plug it in at night when the machine is not being used and let it charge up and be ready to go in the morning. That's a great sales. Then it just needs to be put out there and uh, and uh, given a try. And one one way of doing that is if you folks uh, have a, a fundraiser, or a way of raising money or whatever, uh, or grants, uh, get them more and give it to one of the uh, um, the contractors. That that's the best way to get uh, word around is once they. They do it, and everybody, if you ever, what I've been seen over the past 25 years is once somebody buys one, that they'll go right over and go right around the trailer and check the thing out and look over, look it all over and everything. The next thing you know, they're going to that dealer. And, and I've seen dealers thrive, and I've seen dealers drop like a, like an old hat because uh, um, that, that people lost interest in, interest in what they were selling because um, of something new that was out and uh, innovative. I've got another statement I'd like to say, and I probably don't want to get into it because there's going to be a whole uh, argument about it, and I'm sure there's a couple of members on the board that will agree with me, is that, that you guys are just in a tug of war with a and you, you guys want to stop water runoff and stuff. Well, somebody mowing their lawn at three inches it is not going to have a real effect. But then, then you look at a and R, just like Rolly said with the with the uh, the ditches and stuff. The reason you got water runoff now that your rivers and your brooks are not dredged; they are filled with silt. You know, for for years and years and years. This little brook right here on the on the brook road. Just when I was a kid, you could swim the whole length of that thing. Now you can walk across it. Not even get your foot wet. That's where your water is coming off. Runoff is coming from. It's not coming from somebody's lawn. It, if they won't let you in there and dredge your rivers to keep the water within the banks and you would not have runoff because water would not go over the banks and it would not be washing the phosphorus and, and the kale manure and stuff into the water. You know, my hat's off to what you're doing or trying to do, but it's almost like pushing butter uphill. It just ain't going to melt to a tinker's dam unless you can get those people to get those waters back in the banks of the brooks. Uh, and I'd like, to, I'd like to add to that that the uh, uh, the rivers have a natural fit filtration system already built into them. The good Lord put it in there already, and it's exactly what uh, Dave is telling you. Um, years ago, the farmers were able to take out so many yards of gravel out of the rivers, and then they were worried about it affecting the culture of the fish and stuff like that. If that was to be managed, it would slow down the flow. And, uh, and stop the erosion, and it would um, make it so that uh, some of that water going down through would be filtered a little bit better. Just to add to, and I, like I said, I, I agree with what Dave's saying, that uh, the grass will do um, slow down and stuff too. But you, uh, another thing I'm thinking about is that if you uh, let the, the tailings of it build up eventually, it'll form a mat underneath the, uh, the, the, the new growth, and uh, that can cause uh, uh, more harm to the grass and, uh, than than uh, cleaning it up, that type of thing. So, just just some thoughts. But I do like your uh, your, your proposal and, and how you're headed with it. And I do like the, I don't like smelling like gas at the end of the day either. I know Roland does, but uh, um, but I, I I don't like smelling like gas at the end of the day either. So, thank you, ladies. No, I think so. And, and Brian, does. Brian, <laughs> you're right about the rivers and Davis too, and I agree with you. And the fishing was a lot better 30 years ago than it is now when they were doing that. So it sounds to me as though you got the uh, the select board is supportive of, of what you're trying to do with mixed sentiments about how successful are, but it will be. But hey, you know, every journey starts with one step, right? So we gotta, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll do what we can do. Well, the Energy Committee, I think, has asked a couple times for, uh, I think what they intend to say was, can you vote? 
approval for those three programs in Hyde Park, which they will use to let other agencies know that this town of Hyde Park, not just the energy committee themselves, supports those three programs. So just like anything, if, if you select board are supportive of the energy committee pursuing those three programs, um, then that could be done through a vote, which is more valuable to their mission, knowing that they have uh, the select board's back. So, you know, they got your back kind of thing where you, you're, you're speaking for everybody as the select board. Um, if you can't take that vote, then you can have your, uh, we support what you do and carry on, but that's a little less valuable, I guess. Right, so <clears throat> somebody want to make a motion to support their their process and their conversations? I move. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay, there you go. Thank you. We're Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. you were unanimous and self was unanimous as well. So Thank you. Hey, our pleasure. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, I th I'm thinking most of the select board chastity may not be, but I'm old enough to remember when everybody was pushing us away from electric. <laughs> okay. And on to gas. And now it's like, okay. And natural gas. And now it's okay. Now we're not supposed to do natural gas and everybody's supposed to go all the way back to electric and all your appliances should be electric. And like, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, the difference now, Susan, is that we, we uh, generate so much um, energy with renewable resources that that's the difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, right. we'll all just well, keep we plugging along. All your time tonight. Thank you for the presentation. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, folks, let's go on to uh, agenda six. Thank you. I, for the and you're welcome to stay. Um, the Sterling View loan repayment. Ron, you want to give us an update on that? Yes, I can do that. We had a closing or transfer of the mobile home park uh, earlier in April from Ken, Ken and Martha Harvey to the new co-op made up of park owners. Uh, everybody owns their home. They don't own the land, but now they do own the land as a co-op. And their uh, results of that closing were, were two, I say pots of money, if you will, which is one is the about $42,000 that was left on a town loan that helped build the park. And then the other one was the annual loan payments, which typically get, you know, that, that year of payments ends right about now in April. So that year of payments also produced $8,000. So it was about $50,000 of revenue that was um, in front of you right now. In the past, the select board has, uh, sent it to highway equipment. Um, I don't know if that's been truck or just the reserve capital fund and uh, economic development reserve fund. Uh, so this year, and there's no constraints on that, that's an annual decision that you make. And when you make the decision, then the, uh, the town office folks make the transfers to those funds or, or purposes. You don't have to make a decision now. My recommendation is you do so by June 30th. So if you want to think about it or talk about it, that's fine. I just was trying to get that resolved by the end of the fiscal year. Yeah, originally with these, um, the CDBG grants, which is what that park was, was, uh, was built with and the uh, different communities took different approaches, but as the money was paid back, one of the, one of the big things about these grants is it's paid back to the town um and and the money in theory was to be reinvested in the town and building community and in and, and doing those sorts of things um we we are going to we are finding ourselves this year in a uh in an interesting situation which the state is finding itself in um 
that we've got if and if you see later there's a variety of uh of other money that's going to be coming into the town we don't know how much it is or or um or what strings are going to be attached to it that's the federal money but we also are still waiting to be reimbursed our fema money from the year ago october sort of thing and when that fema money comes in the first thing we have to do is repay all the pots of money that that we lent again because we are in a situation where we didn't have to borrow any money to pay the bills because we're in a, a solid enough financial shape that we could we could float the money so we have to pay that back but there is certainly going to be money left from that that we can that we can figure out what to do with and um and um i think you probably got it uh yeah you've got it it says um at um item nine the arpa the american rescue plan money that will be coming in that we don't know again what's there going to be some kind of strings um attached to that and we don't know how much it's going to be so um we're going to be in an unusual position where we'll have a a variety of one-time money which is is uh, an interesting situation to be in and we don't have to um, again with with this money with the sterling view money just want to have it cleared up by the end of the of this fiscal year which is the end of June um, I I know I know from experience I I do not envy the crew in Montpelier right now because in some ways it's easier when you don't have money than when you have pots of money because it's so much easier to spend money when you think that there's lots of money. Um, so I, I think part of it is to, is to, for a bit, just sit on it until we know how much we have um, and, then, and then say, okay, here are some needs, here are strings attached to the different money and here's what, here's what uh, I'm, I'm sure, and I think particularly with the with the federal money, um, depending on what we get and what the strings are, asking the variety of you know like the you know the library, um, the fire department, you know who else in town, um, what their sorts of needs are, and again thinking of issues that COVID has has brought up. I think I think for that money, two of the Two of the big things are are going to be doing the uh, a, a good air transfer ventilation system up at the garage, which is we're years behind in doing, but also doing the same thing down at the town offices. When the town offices were redone, that was in the original plans, I believe, but it got to save money as we got close to the budget that got that got kicked out. Um, and I'll I'll be amazed if those two projects don't end up taking care of a lot of the money. But again, we don't. There's there's so many numbers floating around. You got no idea what you're going to get. You're going to get anything from two hundred thousand dollars to six hundred thousand dollars, and you know, we'll just we'll just have to see what it is. But just just to be aware that it's um, it's an in, it's it's an interesting situation to be in. And again, I think what's important to remember is it's all. It's one-time money, so it's not something that you want to you want to build an ongoing an ongoing cost for. This um, this the money with um, um, the payments that have come in from Sterling. Again, we put some into economic development, and then have been you know putting it into. We know for both the town equipment and the fire department equipment, um, we're trying to put money into it every year, but. Uh, but we're behind in that, so those are those are always very good buckets to drop one-time money into, so that hopefully in the future, then we don't have to borrow money that when when it comes time to buy those expensive pieces of equipment. But um, anybody have any initial thoughts on it, or I think it'll be good once we we have it, as I say, and again, I think particularly the federal money to see if uh, um, 
Well, with that, and also with this, with the sterling money, which again, originally the CDBG grants, which this is what that money was, was to be paid back to the town and to continue to be used for um, town improvements, economic development. Um, you know, maybe we have an opportunity to do a little bit more of that with some, with some one-time money. We'll just. Uh, it's no problem. We could probably all sit down and by tomorrow we each come up with a list spending, a, you know, seven hundred or eight hundred thousand dollars without any problem at all. So, anybody have any initial thoughts about it? Like you said, I haven't I haven't had a chance to really put a lot of thought to it, but I do believe that I can come up with a whole list of stuff. It, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. it just take a matter of talking to a few people and then we'd have that list. <clears throat> I do believe that, um, like you said, the ventilation system is something that the employees have been talking about uh, for some time now uh, in the town garage. I hadn't heard about the one at the, at the uh, town offices, but uh, um, that's just more or less a, a heat exchanger type thing with a, f a filtration system on it. And, uh, it'd be it'd be interested in seeing what the pricing would be on that. And uh, uh, now I I don't know. Um, I know that those companies that are doing that are very taxed right now because yeah. of the school systems and the other other uh, municipal right. buildings and stuff like that. So when you're when when you've got more work, you know what to do with. You know what happens with the price, right? It goes sky high. So. It's something to, to move slow, but yet, uh, you know, be frugal with it too, but also uh, uh, get something done that haven't been able to get done. Right. Well, and I think Ron had, uh, we checked out what it was going to cost. It, it's sort of early in the COVID thing because we'd been talking about doing it. So I think we had some them prices as to what it was going to cost. And even then, you couldn't get anybody in. And the good thing about this federal money is I think you're like you're gonna have like up to three years to spend it. So it's not like, oh, any actually anything that we're getting, we're not under this, oh wow, we gotta spend it right away. So it's it's right, it's time we can stick it aside, let it learn a little interest, come up with a really solid plan for what's gonna be the best use of this kind of money. So that, that was my suggestion, I was gonna say, uh, we can't act like uh, little kids that just barely get their allowance and go out and try to buy candy with it. Put it in a cookie jar sometime, and something comes up, we'll have some money. Yeah, right. Or, or again, when we when we finally know the total amounts of money that we have, say, okay, what what are some, you know, what are some things? He, here are some one time opportunities, um, you know, that could be really helpful. I mean, just one of the things seeing seeing fun things community things happening you know in Hyde Park I mean that's the kind of thing that you know that uh, now watch I'll get in trouble for saying this but you know a, a thousand bucks to the ball field and that's and the crew that's doing all that kind of work to help them with equipment and that sort of stuff you know to be able to have some money that could help do something like that could be you know we aren't very often in that kind of a position but again we don't have to spend it right away so we can sort of set it all aside and and come up with some plans because we know there are always big expenses that are that are uh, that are coming up. But again, and, and a uh, and a, a not very frequent but a uh, not unpleasant situation to find ourselves in as a select board and and at, as a community and and again part of the reason because it's it's many years and you're Dave you're the longest one on here but it's. It's, it goes back many years of the select board really developing good, sound financial policies. And when you've got a little bit of money, trying to put it aside so that when something happens, you've got the, you know, you, you got the money. Uh, oh, let's, <laughs> right, so let's go from spending money to the annual liquor licenses. Let's, we should have done it the other way around. <laughs> Who's, who's up for liquor licenses, Ron? I'm all for it. Okay, so um, I can. There's all the permits that you could possibly get from the state of Vermont are covered by our three businesses. So, if I'll just I'll read what the approvals are that they need by May 1st. Their current licenses run out uh, April 30th. 
So 10 Ben's beer, outside consumption only. That's a special permit. Uh, fork and gavel, first class for restaurant. And that is a category where they're gonna set, sell uh, beer and wine. And the third one is VFW Post 7779, which is first class for a club. And then third class for club liquor and the outdoor consumption or outside consumption. The only one that we don't have is the retail sales, which would be um, maybe someday we'll get a retail sales that asks us for a permit, but we don't have that right now. So anyway, those those three can be approved in those categories. Uh, Kim has to process that with the state of Vermont and due to COVID, they're accepting your minutes instead of signing. If you remember signing those little thin lines over and over again, you don't have to do that. So the minutes will do that if you have a motion. Do all three of the facilities now have a liquor license? Yeah. Um, they all, there's nothing new here, if that's your question. Aim as last year. Okay. And we, we, we overcome the, I don't know where I don't want, we overcome the obstruction of the fork and gavel having the liquor license that close to a school. Uh, they have beer and wine close to a school. We talked about that a couple of years ago. I don't, I don't think we had any statutory issues with that. And there was no big community outcry. I think it was a, um, it was a good discussion from what I remember, but it was a yeah. this makes the business work discussion as well. And without it, it would have hurt the business. And I and I I don't we don't have a local ordinance that prohibits, you know, alcohol sales within 500 feet, those kind of things. So well, and I, Dave, we had the um, the conversation. I'm trying to remember with this who because we said, well, let's just talk to her and let her know. And I think they actually went in and, uh, and and talked with the folks at Fork and Gavel and said, "Oh no, they don't. They don't have any problems at all. This isn't the kind of business that you're worried about kids being exposed to or getting alcohol." In, in that case, I will make a motion that we allow the three businesses to uh, carry on their liquor licenses. Check second. Okay. Any more questions? Cassidy, you got any, need any more information? Well, super. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay. Susan, you're muted. Yeah, no, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to get all the way back up to the, oh, we got Susie. Okay, there are the liquor licenses. Oh, the uh, new universal guidelines. Um, I, I uh, and, and again, I think we're smart just trying to keep up with what the state is doing. Um, I'm thinking, and this is, I'm, let me know how everybody else feels. Uh, first, I think for permanently going, going forward having access the way you know folks can get in and it's easy including even with with youtube um you know the the easier the access the you know i i think i think that's good for the public to be involved um i'm if if other f if the majority of folks are comfortable we could what we do next meeting do may 3rd to do some policy stuff if people are ready to get together with the you know back in the back downstairs in the building with masks and the distancing but still keep the public um online i'm i'm comfortable doing that but it's, it's definitely is not a requirement and if people aren't comfortable doing it you know, we can call in and do it this way or we can at least go through the may 3rd meeting doing it you know just this way sort of where, where where are folks at and what would you like to do i'd like to see in-person meetings
I, <clears throat> I've been vaccinated. I'll, t I'll say that publicly. I don't know if I can ask anybody else that, but I've been uh, vaccinated. Yep. So I, I, feel, I feel comfortable. <laughs> Rothy and I have been vaccinate, vaccinated. We have our miserable after days to, <laughs> to prove it. How about, it's like you got off a jet for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think the reason why I didn't have any side effects is because I was eating the stuff for the last 12 months. <laughs> Good, Good, for you. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Dave, Dave, where are you? You want to come in or, and again, people wanting to continue to do remotely is fine. Yeah, I'll come in, but I mean, if, if somebody wants to stay home, they can still uh, come in like we're doing here or go in. Yep, yep, exactly. And I'd say, Chastity, you okay coming in? Yep, I sure am. And I, I okay. feel like especially policy work, that probably would be easier if we were all together anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I think it is. But, but we'll keep at least, I'd say at least through May, Anybody that wants to talk to us can can call in and we'll do it this way. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep, and I okay. won't be fully vaccinated, but almost. I get my second shot in a couple weeks. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and again, we had before this, when none of us was vaccinated, again, if you're downstairs and you're six feet apart and everybody wears masks, you're, you know. They trust you. Yeah. Yeah, Dave. Don't don't listen to Roland because there's nothing to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Roland and I are just big babies. <laughs> and that's the reason why we need to have you and Roland back, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. We did the mark. Oh God. Okay. Um, item ten. Mr. Bartlett's back on the and as I say, he's not related to me. Um, Mr. Bartlett is back on the, you want want to give us a, uh, God, an, an update? Here's why you don't ever want to be a landlord. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, lesson here. Um, Mr. Bartlett had a cashier check last year to buy back his property uh, last fall, and that uh, for a lot of reasons, paperwork wise and otherwise, it dragged out past the life of the cashier check, about $4,800. Cashier checks are good for 90 days. So in the interim, through this winter, we tried to get more paperwork together and get it signed. And no, no luck getting everything signed until we called the sheriff's office for support. And they got the last paper signed a couple weeks ago now. That left the onus on Mr. Bartlett to get a new cashier's check and, and go see Kim at the town office who was waiting to finish the transfer back to him. And that never happened. So town attorney and I and Susan had a quick conversation, but it was along the lines of, can we set a path of action where no matter what his choices are, we conclude this thing? And he, if he delays, then this happens. If he does this, then that happens. And really, it comes down to having it all sort of buttoned up legally, a little more legal cost, and basically hand delivered to him with a maybe a visit from a select board member, kind of his last chance to avoid what could be a protracted, expensive legal matter. So Dave's on vacation this week, but I think uh, the initial plan was to update you tonight and then when dave rue the town attorney gets back next week uh he will need some direction from the board about whether to pursue this new i guess you call it legal case to either get him mr bartlett to do what he needs to do what he promised to do to the purchase and sale agreement or uh, bring suit basically in Memorial County and make it happen through a judge. Essentially, we mean the town got the property back in the end, or the judge comes up with some kind of arrangement for um, for, for Mr. Bartlett. Then, Ron, can I make a suggestion? Of course. Uh, I agree with you, yes, 100%. But I'd like to see it not 
that I'm going to get on any work because I'm going to do it both ways, whether I do it through the town or the sheriff's department. I'd rather see the town spend the 75 or or $100, whatever it is, give it to the sheriff's department to go, to have me go and serve him up there. The reason is, is he's hard to catch. And if I go there three times to the sheriff's department, then we can have a tack order. The tack order will be taped on his door and that'll be the same thing as me handing the paper, telling, giving him a court date to go and, and then it'd be downhill from there. But if we just keep going back and forth and back and forth and forth, it ain't gonna be there. no further ahead than we are now. We gotta have a motion for that, Ron, to um, give the sheriff's department a hundred dollars to do that. No, it's it's a little different than that. D Dave Rue, who's the town attorney, is on vacation. When he gets back, and and this is this is maybe Roland is is another answer. Is there some way that the select board could impress upon Mr. Bartlett, regard you know, setting aside the town attorney stuff right now, to make this happen the way it's supposed to, the way he promised in the purchase and sale agreement? Is that a possibility? Can you can one or more of you go meet, et cetera? Can he meet twice? Is there any way to get through to him to because the other I mean, the other option is to is to have the select board advise and request the town attorney request uh, prepare the legal documents to make it happen through the court system so there's two different ways and going through the court system will be expensive for everybody uh, mr bartlett might lose his might lose his interest in that because he he was promised he promised basically through the psa to um to follow through with that and he didn't do that but the only way to enforce that is through the court system so Kind of where we're at right now is you know, is there another way other than the legal way i don't know he's had plenty of time that's for sure he can use the extenuating circumstances due to the covid i can see that happen and uh we don't want to set a precedence that can be used by others in the, in the community if they're in a similar boat um, right in in talking with the lawyer he was saying again sort of part of what we have is because um he he did sign the contract so he's now in violation of the contract so we've got as the town we got a stronger leg to stand on here um as and he said just because he's on vacation this week that if uh if if a select board member or a couple of us wanted to go up and say listen here's where we are and here's what's going to happen if you don't you know if you don't follow through on this you need to and again the bank just told them they just needs to call they'll reissue the check if the money's there i will bet you that the money has already been spent and we're back and he doesn't have the money but again right now there's there's so much money floating around to help people in bad situations he can probably get the money together um so so i don't i don't know if it's um you know Dave, maybe maybe you and I should drive up and, and see if we can have a chat with him, um, and just just see if we can catch him, or um, or if we don't, just wait for um, for David Rue to be back next week, and I think then he will. Again, I think it's going the route with, you know, paying the paying the sheriff's office to go up and serve it because you can you can pay, and I know I think Russia our debt's still on. You can spend forever trying to catch this guy. Let me know when I get my tent in. Okay. Yeah, well, hey, now, this is a great time, Roger. Leap in. Okay. I was there. I bought the property for the town at the tax sale. The town owns that piece of property. So the property belongs to the town now until he's back, right? Uh, so the town is for that water bill. How the town gets their money for that water bill out of him, I don't care. I just want my money for the fire district that I take care of paid up so I can move on with my stuff. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to wait till May 15th because that was the date that the governor gave to give people another month's suspension. Then I'm going to send a letter to the town that I'm shutting the water off. And I know he has two kids. But then the town can deal with it after when I shut that water off. But I will send a, a notice to the town 
that I will be shutting that water off May 15th. I haven't got paid for all that water. And, I, and I've sent the town bill after bill. And I haven't gotten anywhere with it. So that's my final say on that. And that's up to the town to get their money out of him. Because the town does own the piece of property. Okay. So this, I, I obviously don't know a lot of the background about this. So this has been an ongoing issue for over a year, pre-COVID. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. And, and Mr. Bartlett is very good at dragging things out to the last moment, and then he'll show up with a check for just the right amount of money, and then it drags on for something else for another. It's just... It's it's okay. It's now, been an Bill has, yeah. Bill has to pay before the town and give it, sell it back to him. Right, oh, so and the, it was his property that we that Roger bought at tax sale. At a tax sale, right? Got it. Right. Got it. That's where I was a little confused. Gotcha. Oh, okay. Yep. okay. Got it. So, so who who owns the property right now? Us or yeah, the town owns it. So, so uh, w w we could put a uh, eviction notice on it. Well, not in COVID, we can't. Yes, we can. I serve the uh, I serve them that every day, Susan. I I served I served one today. I served one uh, interesting last mm -hmm. week. There's certain certain circumstances that you can. You you can serve an eviction notice, and I would call uh, uh, maybe Sharon over to the office, and she could tell you. Yeah, I think there's um there's the documents that David Rue was going to prepare result in the eviction notice in the end. Mm. So we, there's a le there's legwork before the eviction notice, which has to be done in the right order that David would manage, and then eventually yes. There'll be an eviction notice put on the put on the door, so to speak. Right. And, well, and, and that's when I was saying with that three visits from the sheriff's department, right. th th then it becomes the tie order from from the court, and the, yeah. then he was ordered to come to court. Yeah. Um, well, it, there's there's an interesting um, there's an interesting add on there with the possibility of turning off the water. Um, that's, that's a, uh, Roger, what, what, what process and time frame do you need to do something like that? All I need to do is give, um, I don't know if there's any time frame, but I usually give them, I usually try to give them 15, 10 to 15 days. I send the notice. And oh, if not, oh. If it's not paid by that date and I send another notice what day I'm gonna shut it off. How old are the kids? I, I don't think you can shut the water off if there's minors. Right, right. How old are the kids? I wanna know that. They're probably I, I don't think they're over I don't even know if they're in, nah, they're probably five, six years old, maybe. Uh -huh. I don't I'm not I, I don't wanna shut the water off. Yeah, okay. With yeah. kids. I'm not with, with little kids, right. The kids are gonna pay for it. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to do that. And it's up However, to the town. It's up to the town to pay the water. Right. What what what, what is the water bill, Roger? Anyway, that's what I was just going to ask. Right. How much is it, Roger? Up in my head, I sent I sent all that to Ron and um, or, or to the town. Yeah. yeah uh, Ron, it's not it's not a lot of money. The I the it's you know hundreds of dollars we're talking about. Um, while we've owned the property. The, the question is that the purchase and sale agreement, which is a legal document, requires Michael Bartlett to pay the water bill. I know it. I agree with that 100%, but I don't um, want to shut the water off with kids. Well, that's, no. that's nothing to do with the town. That's a fire district one decision. That's not a town decision anyway. That's a separate independent group that's going to decide to do that. Nothing to do with select board. So, so it's not, it, it isn't, okay for the town to pay the water bill and collect it back from Bartlett? Not right. Really. It possibly could be okay, but that would be David Ruse. Uh, yeah, advice. okay. Yeah, yeah you, you don't want to mess with the contract unless the town yeah, right. knows you're doing something. But you could, right. you could yeah, ask, I, I would ask them. Right. Yeah. 
Okay. My understanding is that you would get it back, but I still don't, I wouldn't do that if it's part of a contract, which it is. Yeah, right. No, no. And, and we're. Yeah, that's, so, that's, a, good, that's a good question. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so it, it seems to me one of the things that's clear is that going, is that moving this ahead is, is with as much haste as possible at this point is what we would like to do. Um, I guess it's, do we think it's worth a couple of us going up there and talking to them or is that just a waste of time which my opinion is it seems to mostly be a waste of time with him but i'd send it to the sheriff's office okay well then then i think what we need to do we'll wait david rue is back and he's been handling it he's back next monday and we'll get him to start that process okay and 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 in that we will ask ron make make a note ask if it's okay for the town to pay the water district so they can get out of it hey we did the rail trail art okay last one the law oh boy the law enforcement study group ron Yeah, law enforcement study group. We had a um, earlier in the month of April. We had a, a couple of the members of the group that was made up of the three towns uh, resign and uh, basically produce their own reports that they had been working on. So there are a couple summary summary reports from a couple of the folks that were working yeah. together up until the beginning of April. And Roger was on that group too, so if he's still on, he might have something to yep. add. Yep, Roger was Roger joined a little late, but he was part of the blow up part of the of the group, not not the cause, just part when it happened. The um, the few that are re are remaining wanted to get direction from the select board uh, about what's next. Uh, do you want uh, a small group of citizens like uh, had been meeting to try to get reactivated with a new mission? new questions to research uh do you want to uh kick it up a little bit to a more of a regional uh agency like regional planning do you want to hire a consultant person to look at the issues of law enforcement study group so they 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 have some good background and data collection that they could share and and put out there as a starting point uh but they really they couldn't pull together a list of recommendations or what the towns, the three towns should be looking at um, as a group. So they basically gave it back to the select boards. And I, Susan might have had some conversations maybe with other select board members, but, um, or the other towns, but I, I think they need a decision. The people that were there, there's Peter Gallo, for example, was on it and Roger Audet. Uh, I don't know if Chastity is going to take over for Roger at some point or not, you know, those kind of things. What what does the select board want to do next was the basic question left at the end of April. I think before we get anybody else, I think, uh, can you summarize what the reason why the people that did drop out dropped out without getting into it too, uh, too deep? Yeah, I, I, there was a, a major uh, discrepancy on philosophy. <laughs> so you had a couple members that wanted to do their own research and say what they thought and wanted that to be the final report. And then you had a person trying to pull together the, you know, corral the chickens into one report and, and challenge some of these statements that were made as either factual or needing more research. And people didn't want to budge. They said, nope, this is what I researched. This is what I want the select boards to hear. And the other opinion was, well, if we're appointed a study group, you're supposed to come out with one report with a few recommendations that we can all agree on, maybe share the differences, but at least try to continue to work on a on a report that makes good sense to give the town some direction. And that's where it fell apart. There was an unwillingness to uh, communicate and mediate or negotiate on the final language of where they're headed for a report. <laughs> It sounds like there might not have been a clear uh, mission uh, in, in, in what they were doing because that no, usually- No, it, it, was, it was pretty clear. It was pretty was it? clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's the problem. It was pretty clear. And some of them yeah, decided that, that isn't where they wanted to go. Really? Yeah. Because the mission would, would direct uh, where they're going and, and keep them on track. Yeah, yeah, well, 
Only if people want to stay on track. <laughs> okay, I understand. Thank yeah, you. It, yeah, it really was. It was interesting. I, That's a point of a mission, isn't it? <laughs> Brian, yeah. I mean, Brian's point is right. I mean, the point of a mission is to keep people kind of on track. Let's do that. And right, and and I think, and so then the, the here, I, I think part of what came out of this, and and Ron and I have talked, and I've talked talked to a, a couple of, of of the two other towns, and they're like, oh, whoa. Um, I, I think first of all, it points out that it really shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that this is a remarkably complex issue. You know, um, law enforcement and what people want and how much you want bleh, is really complex. And it it turns out, I, I think it may be too much of a bite for a whole bunch of us, you know, of individuals to take on. And it turns out, thank you, Ron, for finding, um, that your county planning commission can help you organize and start to do some of this kind of work. And, um, and, and we've, um, I think maybe one of the things we should explore is seeing what the planning commission can do to help us and what kind of structure and what they may find other planning commissions have done to help provide a, a, a kind of a structure to do this. Um, I'm, I'm sure we are not the only communities that are confronted with this, so I'd be um, I'd be amazed if through the planning commissions they are they can't help us um, find out how some other communities are are trying to come up with the necessary information so that you can make a sane you know a, a sane choice. Um, we we've had I, I just in in town uh, Carol Fano who who worked on the uh, you know a lot of the emergency management. Um, she's got a lot of good background in law enforcement, that kind of organization, that kind of structure. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe if we just start by having, getting, checking with the planning commission to see what their thoughts are and how we might, as, as three communities go about structuring this, realizing that there's going to be, um, there, there needs, as you said, Brian, there needs to be even more structure. Because what we're just trying to find out is, you know, really, what what realistically are the options? Um, and I don't think in reality there aren't that many different options out there. So so if here, here are your couple of choices, okay, then which one seems to make more sense and why? And then I think it'd probably be a lot of work trying to figure out what that, what that other option is and how you transition to it. Can I speak for a couple of minutes? Absolutely, Roger. Okay. I came in on board here in the middle of this. I've seen a lot of the, I got all of the documents and stuff. They had done the study. They've got a, they, they've got the times where the officers were, where they've been patrolling. Uh, even we got a list on, uh, um, oh, what was I going to say? On, um, on what, uh, a bunch of questions we asked Roger. We had him. We we had him on in on the phone with us. He answered every question that was asked of him, and there's still, I guess, some people uh, in their mind ain't quite satisfied with that. Um, to me, is that you got to pay for what you want. If you want, you're doing twenty four seven. If you want to cut it back six hours or to cut back to some of the, you know, some of the money, but. If uh, if you're going to have protection 24/7, it's going to cost you money, just like anything else. And uh, and then if we go, if they decide they're going to go with the state police, well, good luck to you because you think you got a lot of trouble going on in the county now with all the, the domestic stuff that they do, the child abuse. Um, there's a big problem in this county, in these three towns, especially town of Johnson. So, you know, with the drugs and everything that's going on, it's going to cost you some money. And you're not going to get, you're not going to get the, you're not going to get the response out of the state police like you're going to get out of the sheriff's department. Because sometimes it'll take you an hour, an hour and a half to get a state cop up here. So, I, I don't know what more we can do, but maybe get somebody's got better ideas why they don't think it's worth the money. I don't know. It costs well, money, educate. 
too. It costs money to buy the cars. I mean, I don't know where, how much more you can ask. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the, one of the other options um, is, is that the three towns could form their own municipal police force. That would be able to afford it. Um, well, and, and again, I think that's sort of what, you know, what, what you'd have to look at, because I think one of the, I think one of the things, and, and I, I think most of the, most of the Hyde Park Select Board is aware of, but, but we have been, and it, it goes back before Roger, um, Lamoille County sheriffs have always been very good entrepreneurs. And, uh, it's the other work that, that they, that they do, um, I, Roger, one of his big things that, that was terrific and has helped the state tremendously was in transporting people, particularly in crisis and with mental health issues, um, and transporting them safely and in a reasonable way and not handcuffed and more traumatized. Um, right. He set up the program for the whole state and, and, it's, and was well paid for that but being well paid for that is is all those sorts of projects that he does as a sheriff really um subsidizes all the work he does for the three towns um the the biggest problem that roger is having right now is getting the state treasurer or the legislature to move so that his folks can get into retirement so he's losing he's losing really good people to towns that have municipal to either Morrisville or, or Morristown or Stowe that are in the municipal retirement plan. Um, and, and, and that's why he's losing them. They, they want to stay with him, but folks are looking at their retirement and saying, you know, I gotta, I gotta be serious about this. And we have been unable to get the state treasurer or the legislature to move on this for I've been working with Roger on this for I think four years, um, and and that's I, I think is for a sheriff that's his biggest frustration, particularly since there's another sheriff's department in the state that is in the municipal system, and why not let us in? But anyway, um, so so I, I again I think, um, and and that's where. You know, Roger, I think maybe somebody like the Regional Planning Commission who would look at it and people would say, well, that's just neutral. Um, again, see what they have to offer for advice or how do we structure their uh, suggestions as to where we should go from here. Look, because I, I'm not, I'm all done on it. I, I think I no need to be going any further. I mean, I'm satisfied with what he does. And, yeah. and I, apparently there's a couple that aren't quite there yet i have no idea the two more two new people that came on board they still have got some questions i guess yeah dave you can jump in even though you work at the sheriff's department that's okay probably got more better advice for us than anybody else i'm going to abstain from this conversation but I'm, i just want to make one statement there is no money wasted over there yeah. Those guys are stressed out. We got guys working double shifts. Uh, uh, with, with like Rob just said, uh, uh, with the drugs going on and the mental health, them guys are, are yeah. just they, they, they're they they can't do no more for what they got. So no, no. I, I'm I'm just saying that there's not any money wasted. No. How many deputies does he have now, Dave? I was just gonna ask that. I think you're don't quote me on this because I'm not sure and I probably no, I don't this, know either. But I think I think uh, I think forty something, forty four maybe, forty some odd. But they're not all deputies, not off road on road. Some are transport deputies, uh some are school deputies. Right. Uh, some are, are uh are just assigned to mental health. Part time. Yeah, and part time. And so you would have to that would be more of a question for, for Roger. I, I don't wanna put in a position when I'm telling you something that's not true. Uh, I, I think they do a good job too. I, mean, I oh, agree with Roger. I think they do a great job. No, got a hard is, one. Oh yeah. I, oh, I can't imagine these days why anybody would go into law enforcement. 
one of the it, it was interesting on the trip we took that that what was uh, interesting and then i saw it out here today on route 100 but any place driving up down the east coast where a, a car had been pulled over there were two state troopers two cars there nobody was going to cars alone and i saw it out here today a car had been pulled over and there are two sheriff's cars there you know it's just well the what's going on around the world i wouldn't either yeah boy I'm, I'm, i god bless anybody that goes into law enforcement right now and i got a i got a, a nephew that's in that's in law enforcement in atlanta yeah okay yeah <laughs> god bless oh, yeah. You you just you just don't uh, hire a law enforcement officer. It has to be a passion that they have. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and if it isn't, then it doesn't work out. Yeah. And, yeah. and that passion is becoming less and less and less. And one of the biggest things I think needs to be done is education on law enforcement, what they're going through. We always see what the victim and or the yeah. other person's going through, but we don't see what the officers are going through. And uh, it's just the same way in the facilities. It, nobody ever knows what goes behind uh, yeah. those yeah. doors in those facilities. And those of us that do see it uh, uh, yeah. are dealing with it day by day by day by day. Yeah, yeah and that, that's right. And, and it's, uh, most people don't understand it. as simple as uh, uh, pulling somebody over a speeding and giving them a ticket. When, when they leave, that's not over. But, you know, somebody gets a report on child abuse or uh, uh, a drug abuse or something once they visit that house and leave that's not over now they're into the, the computer work which takes hours yep. and hours to document this stuff yep. uh, yeah there's six there's six deputies plus uh starting in july there's a grant position for number seven that's that seventh position is the one that's uh enforcement as well as mental health officer they're trained mm -hmm. in yep. mental health okay. I don't know if you remember from we heard a presentation yeah. from Roger on that. So that that will be seven, but like Dave and Brian and everybody else is saying, it's um, kind of a minimum for what the community needs it right now. Yeah, remember there's 24 hours in a day, and if they've hired one person to do that, they're going to have to cut that person to three pieces and use them that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me see, but I'm not sure sort of, sort of where do we want to go from here? How about Ron, let's just check and see what the, what the planning commission has to, has to throw in. That's not going to cost anything to check with them. Um, okay. uh, I know I, I got a, I, I got a call from Walcott and, and uh, Linda Martin wants to talk to me about, you know, what do we want to do? Eric Osgood and I have had a chat and it's like, you know, what, do, what do we want to do? Um, Obviously, it's a hard topic. It's a it's a hard topic. So if tonight I'm all done, I resign. Okay. 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 Better watch out. We may throw a rope around you. Okay. So I gave you no, my well, opinion about it, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go in any further because if you want the protection, you guys have to pay. That's all there is to it. Yeah. Yeah. Roger, I, Roger, I appreciate all your work. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I didn't do that much that. on it. They all did the work. I just. I in the middle. But look at where you are right now. You're talking about it. And that means a lot. Uh, so you know, and when Ron and I have been to a lot of the meetings Susan had in the past that we used to have at noon. Yeah. And and it's the same old thing. Either you want the patrol, or you don't. I mean, you don't only do patrol. You have you know. You know, some, sometimes they have to respond to an accident. Sometimes they got to respond to a to to a fire for some help and 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 they do get a little bit of he does get some help out of the out of the college down there and plus they get some help from um from the uh the place that's outside of Johnson the Lairway School. Lairway School. And the resource officer is paid by the okay. by the union school, by the school district. Okay. Oh, I, I think a great job. And that's all I, I just recommend it for what he does. I think he's, you know, he, he's not going any better, I don't believe. Yeah. Okay. So I'm leaving you. Okay. 
Okay, Roger, Night. thanks. <laughs> Good night. Bye. Okay, we got got anything else that we need, folks? Well, you in old business and you in uh, old business now? Yeah, sure. You have orders. Yeah. You have orders too. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. Wait a minute, where are the orders? Oh yeah, I can probably want to do that. Well, the Amer the American Rescue Plan was on the. Um, agenda just as a quick update that uh, we're supposed to be getting 50 percent of two hundred and ninety thousand dollars in june and then another 50 percent in december so that, that's the initial you know, every time i see something writing it's the subject to change so don't, don't hold me to the 290 if it turns out to be different but that that's the current estimate it's about a hundred dollars per person uh, by pop population oh okay and a quick question I've got is uh, so the the truck is purchased and the uh, and the oh, yeah. motor is purchased. As far as I know, the truck is done. Uh, Mark was doing the plow late last week. I don't. I haven't talked to him to see if it's done. Done. And then the motor deck, the check was cut, but I don't know if it's in town yet. <laughs> so I, 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 there's no issues that I know of. No. It's just okay. Process. Okay. A question that that, that uh, two questions or two things I've got, or do you want to do the the uh, order first? So why right, not go go? Why don't you go ahead and ask your questions? Okay. Uh, first of all, are we locked into that uh, fifty thousand dollar grant from the for the historical stuff yet? I sent, did, I emailed you guys the draft today. I yeah. don't know if anyone had a chance to look at it. But they yeah. haven't signed it or anything yet. Okay, because this, this is the part that I want to iterate again. And when I talk to a member of the committee for the hall up there, we can do anything we want. We can put any door we want in. We can put any ceiling we want in. But I read that thing you sent me. Thank you, Chas, for sending it. On look at D of your NEPA review, your NEPA review. It clearly states work must be performed in accordance to the Secretary of Interior, Interior Standards and Guidelines of Historical Preservation and Archaeology as defined by the National Historic Preservation Act. Well, when you preserve something, you put it back the way it was. You don't put in anything you want to do. Look yep. at that, and, 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 and it's D. Yep, and I will get clarification on that because that was brought up on the call that we had with, with the woman from the state. And you need to get approval. You can't, the fact that you can do anything you want is a little extreme. That's, we can't do anything we want and it has right. to be approved they have to approve it um right. however she did say that they could like he said he wanted to do some certain painting on the ceiling she said yes you can do that we're not going to tell you what color to do you can do any color you want so she's like but we will give you insight and advice on what they recommend that's right i'm not talking about painting but when that building came through, it came through that embossed uh, aluminum panels. If you've ever been into an old building, you know what I'm talking about. It's a, it's all embossed up there. Now, yep. to replace the ceiling, that don't mean you can put in, in a, a suspended ceiling. Preservation means bringing that back the way it was. See, and that was talked about two days. So I will, because that specifies so clearly in that grant, I'll definitely get clarification on that. Okay, and I don't I don't want the town people to get, get locked into it. And I'll give you a perfect example. If you go into the town store right at the corner of 108, that brick building that sits right there, that's a historic that's an historic building. They can never tear that down. Yeah. You know, or, or, uh, or they can't get rid of it. Now, if we accept that fifty thousand dollars, what if the taxpayers of Hyde Park say, and I'm not saying they're going, I'm just saying what if? The taxpayers of Hyde Park says, "Okay, no, we had enough. We're not going. We're not going to put any more money into that building." 
are we locked in to that building with the with the society that we can't back out of? Yep. Okay. Yep. That, no, that makes sense. And Dave, you're back in you're back in Vermont, right? Um, because the I can set up a time. That woman from the state was really great and very very helpful. So if you'd like, we can connect with her and chat with her because she sure. she is she was she was great. Um, very, that's a good idea. That's a great idea. Yeah, she's very insightful, Dave. So I will um, shoot her an email and I'll call you tomorrow and see what her availability is and we can set up a time to chat with her. Okay, I can talk on telephone. I'm sure I can plug this name thing in where it can work, but uh, <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that, Cassie. Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. And a second thing is I talked to. Uh, I was with Howard this weekend, and he has sent a letter to, to the person that was interested in buying that land next to that, telling him that he's got another option on it, so he needs to know yes or no, does that guy want it or not, and he'll give, he'll give us the next option on it. Okay, great. And great. Last but not least, and it's, and it's not... Uh, well, anyway, just want to go say it. Uh, I had a call from a member of the planning commission uh, because of our, our meeting last time on going to a southern land board. When when asked, does the board know about this? The answer to it was yes, because the chair of the board came back and said that they recommended they want a southern land board. According to him, he has never heard about it. Uh, another member of the board has never heard about it, asked about it. So I am appalled or whatever you want to say that the chair of that board made a decision for the other board without talking to the board members. And then talk like, to them, yeah. yeah. It's it just like you, Sue. You, you, you couldn't make a, 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 a decision without talking to the rest of the board. And, and I think if he... Because uh, I didn't, I mean, wasn't it a minute that you said that he rec recommended the yeah. supplement board and talked to the people? Well, according to the yeah. people, he wasn't talked to. So could you follow up on that? And if so, we may have to reverse it. Yeah. yeah what? The only thing that happened there was we had uh, good people that had applied and needed to make some space for them. So I called Bob Malbon and said, we can go to seven and and make sure people interested want to get appointed. I don't know what why you'd want to disappoint people. Well, no, I don't want to disappoint them, but that wasn't the way it was, it was uh, presented to us. Well, uh, you are the we'll, select. We'll, yeah, we'll 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 check it. We'll we'll check it out, Dave. See what's going yeah. on there. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, no, glad to. Oh, always good to hear that thing so that we find out what is actually go well well hopefully we have some idea of what's actually going on <laughs> okay so that's all i got okay um how about the town orders everybody get them folks look at them I, and and just while while I'm thinking about money, Ron, will um for the for the May third meeting, we should should we have more information about you know if we're going to borrow the money to do the and the bids on the paving and everything. Yeah, so the paving bids, and I hope Brian can hang out for a little bit on Monday the twenty sixth, like one o'clock and see what comes through the door for the center road and Sterling view bids. Uh, I'm guessing most people are gonna mail them in, but uh, there still could be some people that wanna show up and hear what the what the bids are, which they typically do. We can do that downstairs with, with spacing. Uh, the state legislature is meeting next week to possibly consider increasing the state highway grant program uh, for class two paving from 
a maximum of 175 to 200,000. Uh, so if anybody knows some state legislators, there's some pushback saying it's too much for the towns. And of course, VLCT says that 175 hasn't changed for 10 years. So it's about time you went to 200. So if anybody wants to make a call to whoever the money people are at the state house, that would be good to keep that 200 the way it is. And, and then they can keep it that way for 10 years if they want to, but it's overdue for a change on that. So we, we won't know if it's 175 for a while, but um, we will know what the cost of Center Road is going to go very shortly. Hey, Chastity. My, my, yep. my, cell, my cell is 274. Okay. 0840. Okay, perfect. Okay. I'm emailing right now, actually. <laughs> okay. Okay, is everybody okay with the uh, with the town orders? Yes. Okay, need a motion? So I'll move. Second. Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay. And the last is, uh, let me see. <laughs> well, it's going to be May. It's green up day. And as I say, we, we once again up in uh, Liz up in North Hyde Park. And um, I'll do it working with the library down um, down here. So either out in front of, uh, of Fork and Gavel or in front of the library just to be there to, to give folks bags. It's interesting. Folks appreciate being able to pick them up right there as they go as they go through and um have you been getting more calls about daffodils ron yeah there's some good uh i guess they came up <laughs> yeah yeah we, so i think we'll we can order another batch they're you know i don't know three, three or four hundred dollars and try to get a couple good years in and then they kind of they go by themselves after a while um probably about 15 years ago somebody did the same idea and uh, route two in from richmond village to the park and ride and there's a whole bunch of daffodils coming up all by themselves now and i think they yeah. only did they only did that program for two or two or three years then that petered out but the flower stayed so yeah sure. good, good comment so far yes okay um can we still yeah. get bag green up bags at the town clerk <laughs> Are they going to leave them in the hallway or is, are we only going to be able to get them that yeah, day? The, the, week, the week before green up day, which, you know, start next Monday, Kim tries to keep some bags out front. And then on Saturday, main street and um, the Grange hall. Yeah. Okay, cool. Who, who, who is the go-to person for green up? Depends on what your task is. <laughs> well, well, I understand that the, uh, uh, Green Mountain ATV people uh, want to show their appreciation for the for yeah. Hyde Park for open the roads, uh, and they want to do some green up for Hyde Park. Yeah, so Kim Kim is taking notes at the office where the bags are going, uh, but but with with the ATV people, they can cover a lot of territory. So they they can pick a road and call Kim and yeah. just say, "Hey, we're going to be doing these roads," and then they can get bags. Uh, either on that Saturday or if they want to start early, they can start on Monday. I'm not, people, we've kind of blurted out a little bit to that week, just people get anxious and there's been some activity already. So if the ATVers wanted to get going early and, and let us know what route they're going to be on, uh, maybe it's just the cross, the cross town route that they have. I, I would recommend they do the, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, from uh, right. So Silver, Silver Ridge road. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Do it really well and rake it too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Anybody got anything else? Yeah. I had the advertising goes for the listers anyway. Uh, no, no requests for listers. The uh, I, I tried to call Morristown and they were busy. There's a consultant assessor that works for Morristown. She's too busy. Um, if Julie actually leaves in a month, which is her plan to leave in 
close on our property and pack the car, uh, we'll have to work with Nemric uh, and hire them as a consultant to help the um, <laughs> help the one lister do what he can do on on his own. So I don't. Are you offering to be a appointed lister, Roland? No, but I <laughs> I know somebody that's retired has done that for a long time, and I was just wondering, waiting yeah. to get a hold of you. Yeah, no, about it's a, because it's a, yeah. Matt Reed is operating by himself, and the, the position is really light duty for somebody that can just meet with Matt to sign some papers. There might be a couple of grievance hearings coming up, but we'd have the concern, work, you know, working with you. It wouldn't be a, you wouldn't have to learn everything new. It would, it would be working with a consultant, but we do need a full board of listers, somebody to sign um, papers. Those kind of how things. many hours a week are we talking again? I, no. I, I, well, there's, there's, there's no hours really. Uh, to work with Matt Reed, who's your only elected lister, he comes in to sign papers, and then there'll be a couple of grievance hearings in June. Um, but other than that, there's not a lot of hours because the the real hours are what Julie Rowletter is doing, which is you know between four and eight hours a day a week. Four is okay. I'll probably send somebody. I'll send talk to somebody and yeah. give them your number on and let yeah. them talk to you. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. It's uh. We need to work with somebody. It's um, time to time to make a some action here on this one. Yeah, I'll it's get really a hold big. of him this week, and um, by the end of the week, he'll call you one way or the other. Okay. Yeah, Perfect. and I might. I also might know somebody. So if Rollies doesn't work out, let me know, Ron, because I I have yeah, someone that might. There's sort of two. There's two positions really. There's the elected vacancy, which we select board should appoint somebody to be a quorum on the board of listers. So there's three people there with one right now. So if you can get one person that just shows up to sign papers and attends a couple of grievance hearings in June, very low duty. The other person is more of the working, or, you know, assistant to the board of listers at that four to eight hours a week. Two, two different jobs. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, we're in good shape then. Motion to adjourn. So <laughs> all, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, everybody have a good week. Rolly, hope you're feeling a lot better. Well, if I could get over this fever. Yeah. Good night, I'll see you, Dave. Bye, everybody. Have a good week, everybody.